And uh, it's good to be here this Sunday morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. Good job getting to church this morning in person, online. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, Here's what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18 in the New King James Version. It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. This morning, we continue with part three of our series, Unfolding the Future of the Second Coming. Unfolding the Future of the second coming. Lord, we thank you for your word. We believe it is the word of God, and we believe it has the power to transform us into the likeness of your son. And so I pray, Lord, that you would fill us full of the knowledge of your word this morning, and I pray we would not be the same. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. We've been looking at unfolding the future. This is our third installment of a four-week series. We looked at unfolding the future of society two Sundays ago. And we looked at all the negative things that are culminating as well as the spiritual outpouring that's culminating in the last days. We looked last week at unfolding the future of Israel. If by chance you missed last week's message, I want to urge you to go on YouTube this week, uh, get the notes from the mobile app, and and go through that message because I walk through in detail what the Bible predicts about the nation of Israel, how the Bible predicted the the, the, the reformation of Israel as a nation in our days starting in 1948 and continue in 1967. And and we talked about how that represented the fullness of times of of the Gentiles that which Jesus spoke of and how Israel is a key to understanding the prophetic timeline that we're in. Don't have time to redo the message, so if you missed it, go back and check that out. But this morning, I want to talk about unfolding the future of the second coming. The return of Jesus is a future event that all believers, biblically, should be anticipating. That Jesus is going to return to be reunited with his church as the bridegroom and the bride. And he will remove believers from the earth, we believe, before the seven years of tribulation. It's a key ingredient to the message of the gospel. The gospel is simple. It's that... All mankind has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but God sent his son, according to prophecy, to die on a cross for the sins of mankind, to rise from the grave, to ascend back up into heaven, and that he will also return again. That's the gospel message. And if we place our faith in Jesus, if we confess our sin and repent of our sin and and invite him into our heart as Lord and Savior, our names will be written in heaven. Our names will be written in the Lamb's book of life, the Bible says. But the gospel message includes the second coming of Christ. If you leave out the second coming of Christ, it's not the complete gospel message. And the Apostle Paul is here responding to questions that the church in Thessalonica has about the second coming of Christ. And They were concerned because he had taught there about the second coming of Christ. He had taught about the catching up of the church. And they suddenly became concerned about those who believed in Christ but had already passed away. They were buried. And they were concerned that they were going to miss out on the catching up of the church because they had already died, though they were believers in Christ. And Paul was answering their questions saying, no, 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 they're just asleep. They're just asleep. And he was talking about how they're going to both together be caught up. We'll look at that here um, in a moment. But it's a picture at the end of the day of a bridegroom returning for his bride. The second coming is the bridegroom who's engaged to marry his bride coming back to, to finalize the deal. That the catching up in the church leads to what Revelation talks about, the wedding supper of the Lamb, where we are brought to his banqueting table and we are finally with the bridegroom. That as a bridegroom loves his bride, so Jesus loves us. That's the picture here of the second coming of Christ. And so there are unique qualities of the second coming that are important for us to understand when it comes to unfolding the future of the second coming. The first one is this, is the trumpet blast. 
Paul says there's going to be a divine trumpet blast that marks the second coming of Christ and the catching up of the church. Now, in the Old Testament, trumpets were used to gather for war and worship. They would use a shofar, and they would sound an alarm with the shofar, and it would be a signal to, to gather and to mobilize for war or for worship. They would use these trumpet blasts at the, at the religious festivals as well. And Paul says, in the same way that happened in the Old Testament, in the same way that happened in the nation of Israel to gather the people, to mobilize the people, in the same way to announce Jesus' second coming in the earth, there's going to be a divine trumpet blast from the Lord that's going to announce and gather all believers, dead and living, together back to Christ. Um, the next unique quality is this, that we're going to be caught up and transformed in an instant caught up and transformed in an instant. This is where, when we read that phrase, caught up, this is where you may have heard the word rapture. Anyone heard the word rapture before, right? Rapture's not actually in our Bible, but the phrase caught up is, and in an old translation, many moons ago, it was called the Vulgate, or the Latin, they, they pulled this word out called rapture, but it means the same thing as the word caught up. And it says, uh, if you read 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 55, I won't read the verse, but it says that this is going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. You say, how long does that take? It takes like, that. there you go, it took that long. That's how long it takes. Try it again, just, just blink your eye, like, that's how long it takes. Just like that. That we're going to be transformed. Now, the dead will rise first, Paul says, and then those believers who are still alive on earth will rise then. It happens like one, then two, but it really happens almost simultaneously. The dead will rise, and then a millisecond later, those who are alive in Christ will rise and be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. It's, it's, it's basically simultaneous because it happens in the twinkling of an eye. But it says there in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 55, that our fallen body that's decaying because of original sin that we inherited from Adam and Eve. You know this is not what God intended? It's not, this is not what God intended. And praise God for health. And some of you are working out, you're like, hey, I'm proud of what I got. And praise God, we're all happy for you. We all rejoice with you. But, but some of us, as we get older year by year, we feel like we get a little slower year by year. And we feel like gravity gets a little heavier year by year. And, and this was not God's inten his intention. His intention was for us to live forever. And for us to have glorified bodies. But because sin entered the equation in the earth and in humanity, we have what we have. But when Christ returns, we're going to be transformed. And what's corrupted is going to become incorrupted. And we're going to receive our heavenly bodies. I'm asking God for some specific things. You might get to heaven and... And someone may come up to you and go, who is that guy with the giant afro walking around the golden streets? That is the biggest afro in heaven. Oh, that's Pastor Andrew Mason. He has Jesus. If he could have the biggest afro in heaven. I already asked for it. It's too late. Man, I should have asked that. You should have already asked him for it. I'm already on the list. You're in the waiting line. If I change my mind, you'll be up next. But I already asked for the biggest afro in heaven. No, we're going to take on a glorified body. Jesus was transfigured before the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration. That was a foreshadowing of what we're going to experience at Jesus' second coming. Elijah the prophet was caught up. He did not see death. He was caught up by a chariot of fire, and he was taken up into heaven. In like manner, we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and it's going to happen all in an instant. The next thing here is it's going to be unexpected to the unbelieving. Unexpected to the unbelieving. And I have different scripture verses there um, to, to mark that, that you can get extra credit with Jesus and read later in your own time. I encourage you to do that. But I, I think of, I don't know if you're, if you're a fan of the Avengers movies, and maybe you're not, so, so uh, bear with me here. But if you remember the Avengers movies, there was the Infinity Wars and uh, the Endgame movies, right? And uh, thank you, there's five people who have seen this movie. Okay, well, I'm just, everybody else just come back here with me in 90 seconds. But, but for, for those of us that watch these movies, and I have kids, and that's my excuse for watching them, um, is 
is there was a moment where uh, half the, the population in the earth vanished. Now, the backstory behind it has no parallel to biblical theology at all. So it's a science fiction Disney comic book movie, okay? But there's a, there's a, a dramatization of half the earth's population vanishing. And it was fascinating for me as a Bible student of the second coming of Christ, where I understand the church is going to be caught up in the air, and it's, it's going to be an unexpected moment for the unbelieving world. We're going to vanish in the twinkling of an eye. It was interesting to watch it dramatize, although, again, the backstory of the movie has no parallels with biblical theology, just to be clear. And you see people suddenly vanish and what the reactions of, of people might be, it was interesting to watch. Now, there has been dramatizations of the second coming of Christ and the catching up of the church in Christian culture, songs, movies, media. Thank you, Kirk Cameron, Nicolas Cage. I never saw the Nicolas Cage movie. But, but there has been dramatizations of it. And there's different inferences that are made that aren't necessarily in the Bible. It could happen, but we don't know. So some think that there will be a complete confusion amongst unbelievers as to where the believers vanish to when it happens. Others think it could be leveraged by the enemy to create some false flag conspiracy theory. But we, from Scripture, we don't exactly know how the unbelieving world will respond. What we do know is that it's an unexpected event to the unbelievers. It's an unexpected event to maybe someone who has professed faith in Christ but is not living for Christ. It's an unexpected event. Look at Matthew chapter 24. Verse 40 through 44. These are, these are the words of Jesus. He says, two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left, left behind. 40, 41, two women will be grinding with a hand mill, speaking of uh, women making flour. Uh, one will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Interesting, Jesus likens his second coming to a thief breaking into your house in the middle of the night. That doesn't sound like a very positive thing. He's using this metaphor from the standpoint of an unbeliever. For believers, it won't be like a thief breaking into your house in the middle of the night. It won't be a negative. But to the unbelieving, it will be a very negative event. Because you will be left behind. Left behind for what? Well, we're going to talk about that. And it's going to happen suddenly. There is no schedule. The, the, the thief doesn't uh, leave a note on your door and say, Hey, I'm coming by around 1 in the morning to bust into your house. I'm going to break into your car at 3 in the morning. Could someone tell neighborhood security guards, the guy walking around with a hoodie has banned attentions at 2 in the morning? All right, side note, back to the anointing. Back to the anointing. There's an unexpectedness to the unbeliever as they are left behind. It falls upon them like a thief in the night. Okay, the next unique quality is this. The second coming was promised by Jesus and angels. It was promised by Jesus and angels. John 14, 1 through 3, the words of Jesus, he says this, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you to go prepare. Um, I'm sorry. If it were not so, would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I will come again, and I will receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. In the, the timeline of the narrative of the Gospels, this was the first time Jesus taught on his second coming in John 14, 1 through 3. Let's look at another verse in Acts chapter 1. Verse 6 through 11, this is after Jesus has died on the cross, rose from the grave, walked among, uh, amongst his disciples in the earth for, for uh, many days, and now he is about to ascend back into heaven. So this is like his final, final words in bodily form to his disciples. Verse 6, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Now, if Jesus, if there was a specific date Jesus was going to come back, don't you think he would have told his disciples right there? 
when are you going to restore the kingdom? I'm going to restore it to Israel in 1988. That's when I'm going to restore it. Now, if you've been in Christendom for any time, that's an inside joke that there was people who thought Jesus was going to come back in 1988, and they sold a bunch of books and made a bunch of money. Uh, But no, Jesus did not say, guys, I'm coming back in 1988. You can write a book about it. He did not say that. He says this, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Verse 9. Now, when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, angels, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And so here the angels give a promise to the disciples, Jesus is going to return again. Just as he ascended from earth to heaven, he's going to return descending from heaven back down to earth. Then the last unique quality here is this, that his second coming happens in two phases. His second coming happens in two phases. I want to unpack this in more detail next Sunday, so you got to come back if you want to really understand this. Um, when God speaks of Christ's second coming prophetically in his scriptures, he talks about it like, like it's all just one event. And from his standpoint, it's all just one event. In our finite, limited human perspective, we want to know all the details and we want to know all the sequence. And, and so in our limited, finite perspective of it, it actually happens in two phases. The first is a private event between the church and Jesus. That's the catching up of the church that Paul talks about. The second phase is a public appearance to the entire world at the end when Jesus returns with the angels and the armies of heaven to destroy the enemy and all the wicked nations. We'll talk more about that next Sunday. So as we look at all this, the unique, this unique event that's part of the gospel message that's prophesied and, and promised by Jesus and angels um, and it is, is going to be this unexpected moment that could bring confusion in the world. Uh, we have to ask ourselves a question like Peter asked in 2 Peter chapter 3. He uses this language that what manner of persons ought we to be in light of the second coming of Jesus? How should this affect my, my 9 to 5, uh, you know, daily routine just trying to, you know, I'm just, I don't know about you, uh, sometimes I feel like I'm just a squirrel trying to get by in this life, right? I'm just a squirrel trying to get by, Pastor. What does all this mean? Well, this is how this impacts our life. Number one is I should have great hope to be delivered from wrath. I should have great hope to be delivered from wrath. Now, I don't know about you, I like to win, I like to be on a winning team. There's a lot of football fans, they're encouraged right now because their team is a winning team right now. Everybody's 0-0, except for four teams. There's two that are 1-0. Sorry, uh, Packer fans and Raven fans, you're 0-1 already. Everybody else is encouraged right now as a football fan. My team is undefeated, praise God. I don't know, it's 12.09. There might be some updates to that right now. Don't check the scores. Your team might already be 0-1. I'm sorry if that's the case. I haven't checked the scores yet. But everyone's encouraged because right now their team could be that winning team. Who believes their team is going to the Super Bowl this year? Let me hear it. Yeah. You all could not possibly be right. I have, I'm sorry to say. I said the same thing last year too. It didn't happen. I'm sorry. Everyone's, every, there's only one team that's going to be happy at the end of the year. But no, I, I want to be on a winning team. And so I want to look at some interpretation, some prophetic interpretation here. But here's the, main, here's the main idea. In the end, with Jesus, we win. The times get turbulent. The enemy ups the ante and things get really intense and adverse. But Jesus still wins and he lets us be a part of his team. So most of the book of Revelation, most of the book is regarding the seven years of tribulation. The seven years of tribulation. Tribulation is a time of great adversity, great distress. There's upheaval in nature, upheaval in society. There are wars and rumors of wars going on. 
And I'm going to look at that and unpack that a little bit more next week. But the seven years of tribulation are also referred to in the book of Daniel. Daniel has a timeline of history called Daniel's 70 weeks. And he breaks them up uh, into three different segments. And the last segment is the last week, seven days representing seven years. And it, it's talking about the seven years of tribulation. It's also talked about in the book of Jeremiah as Jacob's trouble. Jacob's trouble is the seven years of tribulation because in the seven years of tribulation, Israel experiences intense adversity and intense trial and tribulation. Now, the, the seven years of tribulation can be broken up. There's the first three and a half and there's the second three and a half. The second three and a half are more intense than the first three and a half. The first three and a half are really intense, the most intense ever up to that point. But the last three and a half get even more intense. They're known as the great tribulation. So you have seven years of tribulation, but the last three and a half are considered the great tribulation. We'll look at all of that a little bit more next week. But I say that to say this. The Bible gives us a clear pattern in scriptures, scriptures that I listed in that point. So if you want more extra credit with Jesus, look on that point and go back and look up those scriptures that I put there. First Thessalonians 1, 10, 5, 9, Revelation 3, 10, Luke 21, um, 34 through 36. And you'll see that God has this theme that his people are delivered from wrath. And we see this pattern throughout different stories in the Bible as well. Think of Noah's Ark and the flood. There was the great judgment of God, the mighty flood coming upon the earth in Genesis. But God saved his people of faith through Noah's Ark. They did not experience that judgment and that tribulation. You have the, the, the judgment coming against the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And God protects and delivers Lot and his family from that judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. You have the, the story in Exodus of the Jews being set free from the nation of Egypt. And God brings supernatural judgments on the nation of Egypt, but they do not touch God's people. The people of God are protected from God's judgment on the Egyptian nation, and they are delivered. They are protected from wrath. There's many other examples in the Bible of God's people being protected from judgment in the earth. I know there's examples of persecution. I know there's examples of martyrdom and sacrifice, but that is not God's judgment. That is, that is the world's unbelief and rebellion and protest. So that's not God's judgment. That's just the world's unbelief. When, when we see persecution. The Great Tribulation is, it has persecution in it, but the main thrust of it is God's judgment in the earth. And so here's a key scripture regarding um, the, the tribulation, which involves the Antichrist, that is connected um, to us being caught up as the church before the tribulation begins. All right, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 through 8. What I want to do here, again, I mentioned this last week, is I want this to be a resource. We're going to keep these notes, and we're going to archive this series in, in, in our YouTube playlist so that as there's a lot of information being taught here that you may not be able to retain, you can go back to this series. And I believe this, these can even be tools to witness and share your faith with other people to, to, to see the prophetic nature of our God and Scripture and how it's predicting what's unfolding before our eyes. But here's what it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 through 8. Are you guys still with me? Do I got any Bible geeks here this morning? It's okay. It's good to be a Bible geek. Amen. I got three. Any Bible geeks here this morning? Anybody want you want to know the word? Listen, you'll know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You want to know the word. You want to know the word, and you don't just want to get all your, all your information and content from your smartphone or a screen. You want to study the word. You want to be a reader. Leaders are readers. It says this, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Who is he? Well, we'll see. And when the lawless one will be revealed, different person, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The lawless one, if you read all of this chapter, it's very clear for time's sake. The lawless one is the Antichrist. The Antichrist. So Paul is saying, listen, the Antichrist is the fulfillment of Satan's agenda in the earth. It's his final power grab. 
It's his final Messiah counterfeit. It's his final attempt to manifest all the junk that in, is in his heart for the earth and mankind is the, the revealing of the Antichrist in the earth. We'll talk more about the Antichrist next week. But Paul says, listen, there is an entity here that is restraining the enemy's ability to fulfill his agenda. It says, only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And there is much scholarship and much study that points to the fact that this verse is talking about the presence of the Holy Spirit in the earth through the church. That the presence of the Holy Spirit in the earth through the church is what restrains the enemy from completely fulfilling his agenda through the Antichrist figure. Because the presence of the Holy Spirit through the church brings the presence of truth. It brings the presence of faith. It brings the presence of the authority of Christ. It brings the presence of accountability to lies and deception. That if the Antichrist were to rise up right now, he'd have a whole army called the church resisting him, pointing out all of his propaganda. And so Paul says the Antichrist cannot be revealed until the presence of the Holy Spirit through the church is taken out of the way. What is that? That's the catching up of the church at the second coming of Christ. So the Antichrist is part of the seven years of tribulation. So this shows us that the seven years of tribulation hap happen after the catching up of the church. This also continues the pattern of God delivering his people before the tribulation, before the wrath of God. Now, if you really geek out and you really get into Bible theology and Bible debates, you will find there are different camps. What I just presented to you is a pre-tribulation interpretation of end times prophecy. Pre-tribulation that we are gonna be caught up as the church before the, great, before the seven years of tribulation. That's also AKA known as pre-trib. There's also a mid-tribulation camp that says we're gonna be caught up in the middle of the tribulation a.k.a. mid-trip. And then there is a post-tribulation camp that believes that we are going to be caught up with Jesus as believers at the end of the seven years of tribulation, post-trip. And so you can get these camps together, and they have all these debates, pre-trip, mid-trip, and post-trip. And it gets a little bit in the weeds, and at the end of the day, they all just, they're all just tribbing. That was a pastor dad joke. That gets really corny. Pastor Bible dad joke. That's as corny as it gets. And here's the thing. Remember, I've told you throughout the series, we need to hold our interpretation of prophecy loosely. We believe it is going to happen. It's a promise. It's going to happen. Exactly how it plays out, we need to hold it loosely. At the end of the day, my faith needs to be ready for anything that heads my way. And I'm ready for that because I know that in the end, we win. If I endure... If I endure whatever the circumstance, we win, the Bible says. And we're going to look at that next week. Next week is unfolding the victory that we have in Christ in the future. Unfolding the, the future victory we have in Christ. So we need to be ready for, for, for anything. But what I also will show you is this, is there's actually, uh, sometimes I think the debate has happened in an incomplete way. Because there's actually a lot of merit to the idea that there could be multiple raptures or multiple catching up of believers throughout the seven years of tribulation because there's ministry that continues. We'll look at this next week. But if you understand that there could be a pre-tribulation rapture and there, there could be a mid-tribulation rapture and there could also be a post, you will see that it actually all fits together and there doesn't need to be a big debate. I will present that to you next week. But this whole idea should fill us with hope. We should not be afraid of end times prophecy. We should not be afraid of the tribulation. We should not be afraid of what's coming. We've talked about the negative patterns in society that increase, but also the outpouring of the spirit that increases. There's greater warfare for Israel, but it says all of Israel is going to be saved. We looked at that last. We looked at that last week. And we see that no matter what happens, Jesus is our bridegroom returning for us as a bride with great passion. So the second thing is this. His delay should be used by us to increase his harvest. 
his delay should be used by us to increase his harvest. People would say, well, there's so much chaos in the world. Why wouldn't God just come back and end it right now? Why wouldn't he just not allow all the pain and suffering that's going to happen? Because it's not just pain and suffering. There is some pain and suffering happening, but God is going to be on the move at the same time. We're going to see that next week. And so God is not being reckless. God is not being aloof. God is extremely calculated. He does not make mistakes in his timing. Sometimes it's not in the time that we want. Have you ever had God answer your prayer, but not in the time that you wanted? Oh, man, God didn't answer my prayer. And then the 11th hour, God comes through. You're like, God, it would have been a lot less stressful if you would have come through like, you know, five days ago. But thank you for coming through. Man, I had to, I had to like use this thing called faith, God. Man. No, God has his timing, and it's very calculated. In fact, look at what Peter says about this in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but he's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I regularly pray for the harvest. I regularly pray for people to come to the saving knowledge and grace of Jesus Christ. This is one of my favorite scriptures that gets me in that heartbeat with God. Lord, you desire for none to perish. You don't want anybody to go to hell. You want everybody to come to repentance that brings forgiveness and salvation and healing and wholeness and brings your plan. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. So Peter's talking about the second coming of Christ. He says, listen, God is not being reckless with his timing here. God, if God came back right now, there'd be a lot of people who would miss out on being caught up together with the church in the air with the Lord. And so the Lord wants to delay his coming not out of laziness. He wants to delay his coming so that as many people as possible can be in heaven together. And so he's reaching out to people. He's waiting for people to hear the gospel. He's waiting to give people an opportunity to pray the sinner's prayer and receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. And he's waiting because he wants everybody. He he doesn't want end. He wants no one to perish. He wants all to come to repentance. And so for us, in this, what you could call delay, it's really God's timing, it's an opportunity for us to co-labor with him to increase his harvest. Remember what happened in Acts chapter one. They said, when are you gonna restore the kingdom to Israel? He says, it's not for you to know the times or seasons, but you will receive power from the Holy Spirit to be my witnesses in the earth. Don't worry about the exact timing of it. Use this time to be a witness for me. Because I don't want anyone to perish. I want all to come to repentance. The family member you have that, doesn't know Christ, he wants them to come to repentance. The neighbor, pastor, even my boss, yes, even your boss. No, he is not the Antichrist. And so the second coming of Christ should fill us with great hope. It should inspire us to co-labor with Christ to increase the harvest in this window of time that we have. And number three, we should be living for and ready for his second coming. We should be living for his second coming, and we should be ready for his second coming. Worship team, you guys can join me on stage. When you've surrendered your life to Christ, and you have a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus, you're not perfect You're not better than people who aren't Christians. But you have been filled with the love of God. And you know, Romans 8, there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. We make mistakes. We mess up. We throw ourselves at the foot of the cross at the mercy of Jesus. We receive communion elements by faith. And we live authentically and honestly and humbly before him. Not perfectly, but honestly, humbly, and authentically before him. But it is possible, it is possible for us to backslide, for us to 
to profess childlike faith, but to make mistakes, to make willful mistakes over and over and over and over again. And to have a, a pattern of disobedience and rebellion before God. It's possible for to completely ignore the gospel, to completely ignore God, to, to, to visit the, the setting of a church infrequently just to check a box or to, to, to check a social uh, uh, you know, dynamic in our life. No, we, we should be in a place where we're ready for Jesus to return. Say it like this. You have to plan, as far as your life, you have to plan like Jesus is coming back in a hundred years. But you have to live your life like he's coming back tonight. Plan your life like he's coming back in a hundred years. Live your life like he's coming back tonight. Thousands of promises in the Bible. It doesn't promise tomorrow. And to those not living for Christ, for those not sold out to Christ, he returns like a thief in the night. But for those of us walking with God, for those of us filled with the presence of God, oh, we long for him to return. The spirit and the bride say, come Lord Jesus, come. We're ready. We're ready to take off this, this, this corrupted body and take on the incorruption of heaven. We're ready for the wedding supper of the Lamb at your banqueting table. We're ready to meet you in the air, Lord God. We're ready to return with the armies of heaven to take care of some unfinished business in the earth. Lord, would you come again? We're ready. We're not perfect, but we're ready. Is there anybody here, you say you long for the return of Jesus because you're ready? Jesus. Read this last passage here. It says this. It says, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. He says, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. You have Jesus, you have Peter, you have Paul. They all use this phrase. Next verse. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light. Another translation says children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. Say, pastor, that's not for me. I'm drunk at night and in the morning. Well, that doesn't excuse you from this. That's a much worse issue and we wanna help you. No, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Can someone praise the Lord this morning? Come on, stand to your feet with me. Stand to your feet with me. Uh, no one moving around, impossible. No one moving around. We are children of the lights. Our walk with God should give us confidence, not self-righteousness, but confidence that we are ready for his second coming. And maybe you're here this morning and you don't have that confidence. I have good news for you. We can pray together this morning. We can take care of some unfinished business between you and God. And you can walk out of here knowing that you're ready for a second coming, knowing that your name is written in heaven. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Oh, I long to pray that prayer with you. 
And I promise if you pray that prayer with me this morning, you will have zero regrets. So with every Christian praying, I'm gonna count to three here this morning. And when I get to three, if you say, I wanna pray that prayer, I wanna be ready for Christ's second coming this morning. I don't want there to be any gap, any doubt, any distance between me and God when I leave this morning. When I get to three, I want you to shoot up a hand saying, Pastor, I wanna pray with you this morning before you leave. Come on, with every Christian praying, I'm gonna count to three right now. The Bible says it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. This is an invitation from your Father to wash up before supper so that there can be fellowship again. I'm gonna count to three. One, you need to get right with God. Two, you wanna pray that prayer this morning. Three, I want you to shoot up a hand right now. Come on, shoot up a hand in this place. Yes, I see some hands. I see some hands. I see some hands. Hallelujah, come on, I wanna pray with each and every one of you this morning. And I wanna ask you to take a giant step of faith that you won't regret. As the worship team begins to play, I want you to step out of your seat, meet me right down here, and we're gonna to pray together before we close. Come on, let's worship right now. Come on down. Come on down. We're gonna to pray together. Come on down. Come on down. Close your eyes. When you're out there, I just want you to do one more thing if you're out in the seat. So I just want you to turn to someone next to you and say, if you need to go down, I'll go down there with you right now. Come on, just turn to someone next to you and ask that. So I want to give one. We're going to pray here in just a moment, but I want to make sure everybody has a chance. You're not going to regret this this morning. You want to take care of some business with God, get right with God this morning. I want you to come down this morning. We'll just wait just a few more seconds before we pray. If there's anybody else, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Just want to make sure everybody is served here this morning. Is there anyone else? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Let's pray right now. We're all going to repeat this together with you. And there is no magic in the words. Come on, we have some more people coming. Come on down. Come on, there's time. There's time. There's time. We'll wait. We'll wait. Come on. Come on down. Come on down. Step up. Step up. Come on. Well, they're still coming. Come on. Come on. <laughs> God bless you. God bless you. We're going to pray. Let's go to close your eyes. Anybody else? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. God bless you. Hallelujah. We'll wait all day. We'll wait all day. We want everybody. God desires for none to perish, but for all to come to saving faith in him. Go ahead and close your eyes. And let's all say this together with our family members, making a strong decision, standing strong this morning in faith. Mom, when you stand with Jesus, he stands for you. I know this isn't easy, but I'm telling you, the Bible says he opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. His grace is gonna be poured out right now. Repeat this out loud. Nice and loud, everybody together. Say this with me, say, Lord Jesus, I invite you into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. 
thank you for dying for me and rising from the grave. Forgive me this morning. Cleanse me this morning. Wash me, Lord. I turn from my old ways and I wanna live for you in Jesus' name. Now just keep your eyes closed. I thank you that right now, Lord, you are cleansing them right now, God. And you are taking their sins, which were like scarlet, you're making them as white as snow. I thank you that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you are filling them with the love of the Father. I thank you, Lord, that they are ready, Lord, for your second coming, God. They are standing with you today, Lord God, and they are ready, Lord God. Nothing is gonna catch them off guard. You're not gonna come like a thief in the night, but Lord, they're gonna be with you, God, when you return. And Lord, we thank you for the plans that you have for them, plans not to harm them, but to prosper them, plans for a hope and a future in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Come on, all the angels in heaven right now are rejoicing over this decision that you made, the Bible says. We are so excited for the decision you made. And we have leaders that are behind you, guys with guys, ladies with ladies. And we would love to pray with you individually for one more moment before you leave this morning. If you just turn right now, turn right behind you, we have leaders that are there with you. Come on. Is that exciting, church? Is that exciting? Come on. While we're waiting for his return, let's increase the harvest. Amen. Church, we love you. If you need prayer for anything, we'll be up here. Come back next week for our final installment of Unfolding the Future. We love you. God bless you. God bless you. Hey, thanks again for checking out ICLB here on YouTube. Hope you're already subscribed, getting notifications. Make sure you're following us on all our social media channels. Download our mobile app and check us out Sundays, 9 a.m., 11 a.m., online, in person. We want to see you there. God bless.